everybody to the last talk of the day. Our speaker is June Ha, who's going to be telling us about open problems on Lorentzian polynomials. Uh, hello, um, thank you for having me. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with you today. And thank you for staying until the very end of today's schedule. I'll probably not say anything very important. So if you wish to relax a little bit from now on, that's perfectly fine. I'll just try to tell you in very broad strokes why certain people find certain things interesting. And I'll also tell you how to make conjectures of your own of certain kind. And once you have made those conjectures, how to make further conjectures that has stronger implications. And that would be pretty much it. And in the end, I will try to tell you some concrete conjectures of me and my collaborators, mostly as a sample of how this process works. So let's say you have an object X. And let's say it has dimension D. And then sometimes we can find starting from that X, a triple of things. Firstly, AX which will going to be a graded vector space with graded pieces that are going to write by K, where K goes from zero to D, which is the dimension of X. And this will going to be a graded vector space over the real numbers R. And also, a K, KX, which will be a convex cone of linear, a graded linear operators that raises the degree of AX by one. So degree one graded linear operators and convex cone of such thing. And thirdly, a P of X, which will be a bilinear pairing on A that pairs elements in A of complementary dimension. And otherwise the pairing will be trivial. And this A and K and P satisfy, firstly, the basic, very basic symmetry requirement, which is to say that PXY is equal to P of a YX for all elements little x and little y in A, and also P of x and ly equal to P of lx and y. So for all x, y in A and L in K. And Secondly, you want the Poincare duality for P in the sense that P is non-degenerate.
And thirdly, you want hard left shits. Which now involves K, which says that for any L in K, the map from A K to A to the D minus K obtained by repeatedly applying L, right number of times, is an isomorphism. For all K at most D half. And lastly, you want this thing called the Hodge-Riemann relations. which says that for any L in K, the bilinear pairing, which is in fact symmetric by the symmetry requirement on K braided P sub A defined by sending X comma Y to minus one to the K of a P X paired with L to the D minus two K Y. is positive definite on the kernel of L to the D minus two K plus one. So one more than what would give an isomorphism in degree K. And for all K. So collectively, this whole thing are sometimes called the Keller package. And the examples, there are not that many, but these examples that we do have are quite striking. Firstly, there is the case when X is a projective variety. let's say smooth and over FP or FQ, where you can take A to be the ring of algebraic cycles, modulo homological equivalence. And then that such uh, A and K, which is the ample cone of X and P is given by the intersection pairing that A satisfy Frankari duality hard left sets and Hodge Riemann relations is the so called growth index standard conjectures. So far unproved, but one of the most beautiful things that you could have predicted about X. And the second case, which is very well known in this community, is the case when X is a convex polytope in which case you can define something called the intersection cohomology or combinatorial intersection cohomology of X. And that is provably, that one does provably satisfy the Keller package, everything that's written here. And the third example, more recent, is a case when X is an element of a Coxter group. In which case you can look at the so called the Sergel bimodule associated to such an X, which do satisfy Frankari duality, hard Lepschitz, and Hodge Riemann relations. And lastly, you can consider the case when X is a matroid. And in this case, there are actually more than one triples you can associate to a given matroid for various different purposes. This one, the length of X. Oh, I should repeat the question. Yes, now I remember. 
So the question by Sasha was that what is the notion of dimension in the third example where X is an element of the Coxer group? And the answer was that the length of X as element of the group. If, that, if it's actually in the vial group, then uh, not just the Coxeter group, if it's crystallographic, then is there is this supposed to be the intersection homology of the Schubert variety? That's right. The question was that in the special case when your Coxer group was a vial group, then this triple A and K and P, whether do they have the geometric meaning? And the answer is yes. And in that case, X labels a Schubert variety in the flag variety of that type. And that one as a complex projective variety has an intersection cohomology, which can be defined over R, let's say. And that one do satisfy in general, all the properties that are listed here. And I think so far, this is more or less a complete list, but what is striking about this list is that in each one of these cases, the validity of the scalar package implies something very fundamental about X. And that fundamental property, usually it appears, cannot be proved without first understanding some of these underlying properties. So it's known that the standard conjectures imply big conjectures on the number of solutions over finite fields. And this was growth and extreme and Deline famously proved the big conjectures without confronting the color package for algebraic cycles. And the case of convex polytop, it implies a generalized lower bound conjecture on the number of faces of various dimensions of the polytop. And when X is an element of the Coxer group, it implies the so-called cosmolistic conjectures, in particular, the non-negativity of the coefficient of the cosmic lucic polynomial associated to the Bruat interval in a Coxer group. And when X is a matroid, uh, you can prove Rotas conjecture. And there's a, something called the Brilovsky's conjecture for the H vectors of broken circuit complex. And there's uh, also Dowling Wilson's so-called top heavy conjecture on the number of flats of various dimension and so on. So for these three different matroid conjectures, you have to use three different A and K and P to solve it. So the really difficult but fundamental and super interesting question is given X, how do we find AX? So apparently from the known cases, the step one is to come up with a really, really good conjectures like these conjectures. So that's the really the starting point, I suppose. And then you start thinking about those questions very hard for many, many years. And then you arrive somehow at the correct object AX. So Grothendieck arrive at the ring of algebraic cycles. And somehow people eventually figured out first by looking at the so-called volume polynomial and then look at the Gorenstein algebra associated to it maybe and to arrive at the, some version of intersection cohomology in the special case of simplicial convex polytops. And here there are several rather deep representation theoretic no, uh, considerations uh, to arrive at the surrogate bimodule. In the matroid case, you can get to the matroid chowering or matroid intersection cohomology by some route. 
But as you can see from the, or as you can imagine from the gap between the years when the conjectures were formulated and the correct object AX were found, usually even after having the right type of conjectures to look at, it's typically quite tricky and requires rather ingenious ideas to arrive at the right AX. So what I want to tell you today is that uh, there is a there is a way to look at things which makes this question slightly easier. And let me try to convince you that it does make the question slightly easier. So typically the degree zero part of AX is one dimensional. So let's just give a name to the generator. So let's say a zero X is spanned by some element. Let's just call that element one. It doesn't really have a multiplicative structure, but let's just call that way. And for linear operators of degree one, let's say Li. Let's define the degree of the product of B of them. to be the value of the pairing of one and this linear operators all apply to one so that it becomes a real number. And the fact is that if you have n linear operators and all of them are in the closure of this convex bone kx then the polynomial in n variables let's say f which is obtained by taking the degree of the linear combination of the LIs taken to the power D is a Lorentzian polynomial. So this fact may not mean much to you at the moment because I have not told you what a Lorentzian polynomial is. But one thing that is miraculous about Lorentzian polynomial is that if you give me a polynomial in n variables, then there is a way, let's say an algorithm, to test whether or not the given polynomial is Lorentzian. So this is a testable property. So before telling you what the Lorentzian polynomial is, let me tell you two prototypical examples of it. First of which may be familiar from convex analysis. So let's say I have convex bodies, C1 to Cn, which are convex bodies in, let's say R to the D. And let's consider the polynomial, some constant, let's say D factorial, and the volume of linear combination of the given convex bodies. So the volume here refers to the Euclidean volume of the Minkowski sum of the given n convex bodies. And it turns out that this is a polynomial in the W of homogeneous of degree D. 
and this so-called volume polynomial is one example of Lorentzian polynomial. It just, uh, it's so just a reminder to myself. You don't need it. But when I want to divide, yeah. So if you look at the proof of this famous Alexander of Fengchal inequality, on the mixed volumes of convex bodies in RD, what is actually proved is this statement in modern terms, let's say. And in general, whenever you have a Lorentzian polynomial, then its coefficients, or rather normalized coefficient, do satisfy Alexander of Fengchal inequality, which says that if you look at the normalized coefficient, by walking through uh, one of the root directions, EI minus EJ, so you multiply by one variable and divide by another variable, then the sequence of coefficients that you meet along that direction always form a log concave sequence, which is the assertion made here. So that's one example, and you could come up with some convex analytic ideas that there are Lorentzian polynomials which do not arise in this way. So volume polynomials are really proper subset of the space of Lorentzian polynomials. And second example, closely related to the first example, which is the case when you have N NEF divisors. NEF divisors are limits of ample divisors, which are up to scaling the classes of hyperplane sections of projective variety. Let's say on a D dimensional projective variety or some algebraically closed field. And then you look at the degree of the self intersection of the linear combination of the LIs. So, this is a co dimension one class. So, you intersect it d times. So, you get the zero dimensional class. You count how many points do you have. And then this the quantity turns out to be a polynomial in W. And this polynomial is Lorentzian as well. So in particular, it satisfies the, what you would call Alexander Fengchal inequality. Um, I don't want to worry about the case where you mean, and I need my variety to be irreducible. And I don't want to worry about whether it's geometrically irreducible or, yeah. But I, I'm open to the possibility that just, just being irreducible is enough, but uh, that's, uh, I haven't carefully thought about it. Such polynomials, Let's give names to them for later. Are called volume polynomials. Over F. And I recently realized that there are Lorentzian polynomials that are not volume polynomials over F for any F. But in the case when F is the field of complex numbers and, and these LIs are ample 
And quantities like this actually measure the volume of the underlying color manifold. So that's why it makes sense to call such polynomials volume, something like that. So let me now tell you what the Lorentzian polynomial is and tell you how to make conjectures of the kind that I referred to before. So we're going to define Lorentzian polynomials degree by degree, where the base case is of degree two. So L naught of a 2n will be the set of quadratic forms with positive coefficients. And with Lorentzian signature. Plus minus and everything minus. So just the n by n symmetric matrices with eigenvalues of given sign. And L naught of dn, where d is the degree of the homogeneous polynomial, will be the set of homogeneous polynomials of degree d in n variables, such that if I take the partial derivative with respect to i variable, it belongs to L naught d minus one to the n for all I and M. So you take up partials in all possible ways until you get to the quadratic case and you want all of them to have the Lorentzian signature as well as positive coefficients. And the definition is that the closure of L naught dn is the set of Lorentzian polynomials. Actually, this funny definition is made in exactly the way that this fact becomes true in the tightest possible way that one can imagine at the moment for me. But the problem with this definition is that there is no obvious way to test whether a given polynomial is Lorentzian or not. So if you have never thought about this sort of a class of polynomials, and if I ask you whether the sum of two cubes is Lorentzian or not, there is no obvious way. Right? This one has extremely simple partial derivative, both of them, both of which are Lorentzian, but that doesn't tell you anything about the original polynomial. In order to say that this is not Lorentzian, you have to somehow explain why it cannot be a limit of such strictly Lorentzian polynomials, L naught dn. And if you want to show that it is Lorentzian, you have to somehow produce a sequence of polynomials that limits to strictly Lorentzian polynomials that limits to that one. So how to decide whether a given polynomial is Lorentzian or not. So miraculously, there is such a way. And let me formulate the answer again, degree by degree. So let's say L2n as a set of quadratic forms with non-negative coefficients and with at most one positive eigenvalue. And for D larger than two, let's say LDn as the set of homogeneous polynomials 
of degree D in N variables with the property that the, all its partials belong to L D minus one to the N. And, and this is the important part. And the monomials appearing in F are the, are the set of lattice points in an integral generalized permutohedron. So a generalized permutohedron is a type of a polytope defined by the condition that all edge directions are a root of type A. So EI minus EJ, where EI is one of the standard basis vectors. And somehow that is the condition that exactly cuts out the closure of L not the N. So the theorem with Peter Branden, who stands for P, is that L D N is the closure of L not the N. So LDN is exactly the set of Lorentzian polynomials. So this tells you a way to decide whether a given polynomial is Lorentzian or not. So if somebody gives you a polynomial, you first look at the set of all monomials and maybe take the convex hole and see if the Newton polytope you get is a generalized permutation. And you also check whether you're not missing anything. So you don't want a hole inside your generalized permutation. Once you have done combinatorial step, the rest is just a signature testing. So a linear algebra problem. So take partials in all possible way. So you get a bunch of symmetric matrices, just compute the eigenvalues and look for their size. So going back to our very ambitious question of finding the right AX, or even slightly easier question or the necessary question of convincing yourself that there must be such an AX for your X that you are interested in. You can proceed as follows. So in most objects of our interest and by us, we mean like us in this room. Uh, many axes are of combinatorial nature, and oftentimes they come together with many different types of generating functions, which often can be encoded in a homogeneous polynomial. If necessary, just homogenize it. So you have a polynomial, oftentimes. And whenever you have a polynomial you want to look at, you immediately test whether the Newton polytope is a generalized permutation. This can be done by computer for small specific examples. And we can, it's often not extremely hard to understand the general case using our mind. And when the answer, when the output of that experiment turns out to be yes, you immediately feed all the examples, small examples to the computer and test whether the given polynomial or generating function is actually Lorentzian. And then you have a pretty convincing evidence, in my opinion, that there must be some AX that the sets by Keller package behind your X, even though you have absolutely no idea or very little idea about the nature of that AX. Well, actually, you know something, some piece of it uh, just by, from your polynomial, 
which happens to be Lorentzian. So whenever you have a homogeneous polynomial, there is a way of cooking up a Poincare duality algebra that is generated in degree one. So Macaulay's correspondence sometimes it's called. There's a bijective correspondence between homogeneous polynomials with real coefficients, let's say, and the uh, Gorenstein finite dimensional algebra is generated in degree one. So that is sometimes your AX, and that's the end of the story. And that's what happened in the case of, say, simplicial polytops. But in other examples, the story is not as simple. First, because your AX may not be generated in degree one. And second reason might be that your X may have singularities. So in that case, you have to replace your cohomology by intersection cohomology, which increases the complexity of the whole picture. But sometimes that can be done. So let me show you some of the conjectures that I and my collaborators generated more or less mindlessly. Well, I, I can only speak for myself. So I just, uh, I have, so I'll show you some conjectures about like matroid generating polynomials and maybe some symmetric functions. I have absolutely no intuition about some of these polynomials that I'm going to talk about. I can barely remember their definitions. I was just told that some of our colleagues are interested in these polynomials. So I just mindlessly ask, I don't even have the capabilities to test feed this information to computers embarrassingly. So I just ask my collaborators to test whether these are generalized permutohedrons, and if so, whether they are Lorentzian. And it turns out that it looks like the answer is yes. So we have made the conjectures that such and such combinatorial polynomials are Lorentzian, but there is no reason to stop here because in our opinion, that is simply the symptom of something else, which is the fact that they are hiding the very delicate color package, the AX, which somehow you should be able to completely write down in terms of the original combinatorial data. So that's one way to upgrade your conjecture. And if you are successful or at least convinced that you are right, you are going to be right up until this point, you can actually upgrade your conjecture further in the sense that there should be should be coming from pictures like this or that. So you can actually predict, uh, give a, make an existence conjecture on a certain smooth, some, some projective variety, let's say. Whenever you see a Lorentzian polynomial that has some reason to believe that it has a geometric source, you can actually make the guess that there should be some projective variety or some convex body somewhere that is responsible for the Lorentzian property of the object in question. So let me tell you the conjectures. Oh, can I ask a question about definition? So in your definition, you have partial derivatives, di, which is kind of partial derivative with respect to some basis. Can yes. you replace, suppose you don't, can you replace these di's by, you know, linear combination of di's? Positives, it's okay. So the so if you don't want to pick yeah. So the is question that. is, can you replace these partial derivatives by more general directional partial derivatives? And the answer I would give is that if you define Lorentzian polynomials in this way using this basis, then the set of Lorentzian polynomials that results is closed under any positive linear combination of partial i's. But positivity is important. So the whole thing, whole picture is like coordinate dependent, like this being generalized permutohedron, for example. But miraculously, the set of Lorentzian polynomials is preserved 
under non-negative linear change of coordinates. So for example, you can identify two variables and so on. And also taking derivatives in positive directions or non-negative directions. One uh, thing, uh, folk wisdom that I learned when dealing with Lorentzian polynomial is that you should always use the exponential generating function and never the usual generating function because roughly because these volume polynomials live in the homology side. So polynomials belong to the homology and the partial derivative operators, they belong to the cohomology. So when you are in the cohomology side, you use the generating function. So this is the system where you can multiply and this is the system where you can not, but which is acted on by these cohomological things. On this side, you have to use the exponential generating functions. So since most of the combinatorial literature is formulated in terms of the usual generating function, it's useful to have the letter for the normalization operator, which transforms a generating function to the exponential generating function, which is obtained by simply dividing by alpha pectoral, where alpha is the exponent. And it's also useful to allow the domain to be Laurent polynomial. So the exponents are in Zn and the output is on the non-negative orthant. So you just throw away everything that's not in the non-negative orthant. And the theorem with Jacob Mathern and Carla Mazaros every Saint Bizier is that for any partition, lambda, if you normalize the sure polynomial in M variables, say, so you have this uh, Koska numbers, lambda alpha, but with uh, normalized monomials. This is Lorentzian. So for example, in particular, rather, you have this Alexander Fenchel inequality for Koska coefficients. So alpha minus EI plus EJ times K lambda alpha minus EJ plus EI. And just uh, from the, this observation, you can make the further guesses. that the normalizations of the following are Lorentzian. First, the Schubert polynomial for any permutation. And secondly, skew shear polynomial for any skew partition and any sure P polynomial for any strict partition and any key polynomial for any composition. and any homogenized growthendic polynomial for any permutation. Here you have to homogenize because unlike the others, you have this growthendic polynomial is inhomogeneous. And also it says an alternating sign in terms of the degree of the homogeneous components. So you make 
all of them non-negative, and then it becomes the Lorentzian polynomial. At least that's the prediction. And I think what's so wonderful about uh, this sort of approach is that you have to like basically know nothing about these things. I, I know very little about these things. The only thing I learned by reading literature and talking to friends is that it's known that for the first four cases, their support or their Newton polytope is a generalized permutation. But just starting from that fact, you can fantasize on and on. So you could imagine the existence of certain combinatorial Keller package behind some permutation or composition that would explain the Lorentzian nature of these things. And it's completely reasonable in such cases that there are actually varieties which explain the Lorentzian properties of this. And actually the proof of this statement for sure polynomials is of course, as you might expect, just look at the right matrix Schubert variety and just realize the whole thing as the volume polynomial over whatever field that you're interested in. So it actually, you could interpret these conjectures as a, some existence conjecture or certain projective varieties. I, I don't hear the question. Uh, I have nothing useful to say, so I'll not repeat the question. So I'm not actually, I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether I interpret, uh, I understood the point of the question. Maybe we can talk later. Yes. So do, do, do you know, uh... Uh, so Lorenz and Pernal who sub support on Mirkovich Yelonin polytopes, which are generalized permutahedra. So, uh, okay, on, there was another question. Um, and something about MV polytopes being generalized permutahedrons. Mm -hmm. So you can see how this would work, right? Whenever you see a generalized permutahedron, you can start thinking about Lorentzian polynomials and then Keller package and then maybe projective variety. But I don't have anything specific to say on your specific. Yeah. So I'll tell you some more con conjectures. Um, maybe this one is a little bit more delicate. No, but maybe perhaps the most interesting. So let's say big lambda is the weight lattice. Let's say for SL and C. And I, I pick a element, a little lambda, and look at the associated irreducible module of highest weight lambda, which will have a weight space decomposition with lambda alpha, so sum is over alpha. So highest weight lambda, irreducible module. And we have, again, quite mindlessly computed some of these weight multiplicities motivated by our result on sure polynomial, which is the case when V lambda is finite dimensional but the weight multiplicities are finite in any case. That the Alexander Fengchel inequality must hold. Alpha minus EI plus EJ. Lambda of alpha minus EJ plus EI. So you're in the weight lattice, you look at the weight multiplicities, you pick your favorite root direction and you walk along the weight lattice and then there will, you will meet a sequence of weight multiplicities and the prediction is that that sequence is always log concave. 
Of course, the log concavity, you cannot help but thinking that it's coming from some Lorentzian polynomial. But now there is an interesting twist, which may be a big hint for the possible geometry behind this, which is that now there are infinitely many numbers which encodes weight multiplicities. So it's not just a question of a single homogeneous polynomial. So if you look at the character, of this, um, let's say character of lambda in n variables w as a Laurent series, which records the weight multiplicities, let's say w to the alpha, and let's uh, ship everything by lambda. So the highest weight is on the monomial one. And the prediction is that uh, if you shift, multiply by a monomial, W to the delta, to this Laurent series, so that this one is homogeneous of degree zero, this is homogeneous of degree delta, and you normalize by which I mean throw away everything that's not on the non-negative orthant. So just to keep the part that is polynomial. And this is Lorentzian for any delta. So if you want to deduce this conjecture from this thing, you can just uh, pick delta sufficiently positive so that it covers the three numbers in the positive range. So the support of this guy is a generalized permutohedron, which is unbounded. And you, you look at the bounded part. So you can further fantasize if you believe in this, that there is a sort of a sequence of projective varieties of increasing dimension, maybe some sort of a limit or pro varieties that know somehow all these infinitely many but finitely determined numbers and encodes their convexity properties. The question is, can you fix lambda and let? So I'm fixing lambda and only. Why don't you run through what the whole series and try and write the series? Yeah, so the suggestion was to vary lambda and alpha simultaneously. So just truly consider the universal case. And I, I have not done yet, but sounds like a good idea. Yes? So the Verma module is actually, a, I think, a special case of irreducible modules when lambda is anti-dominant. And in that case, we have a, another argument for proving this conjecture by exploiting known uh, relation, basically uh, reducing, showing that this polynomial can be realized as in example one, as like, a, mixed volumes of convex bodies. There's a known relation between cost and partition functions and certain mixed volumes of convex bodies. So in that case, this is known. Another case that this is known is of course, this is a case when lambda is a partition or dominant, and that is our theory. So maybe I'll end by just telling you one more conjecture, just to tell you that there are interesting questions, even in those cases where you can prove something is Lorentzian. In my opinion, that's not the end of the story, rather it's the beginning of the story. So this one concerns matroids. 
So let's say you have a matroid M and matroid N and a morphism from M to N. I'll tell you what that is. So matroid M is on the ground set E and matroid N is on the ground set F and G is a function between the finite sets E and F. And you want to, the condition for morphism is what is called the strong map or the quotient in the special case in matroid theory. And the requirement is that the inverse image of any flat of N is the flat of M. And for any such morphism, there is a notion of a basis, which is a subset of E, and you call it a basis of G, F. S is contained in a basis of M, and GS contains a basis of N. So in other words, you want to say that S is a basis of the morphism if S is independent in the source and the image is spanning in the target. So the typical example of such objects, where do you get it? is when you have a rep representation of matroids M and N, where V and W are vector spaces over a field F. And if you have a linear map over F from V to W, and this is a map from E to V is a representation of M, F to W is a representation of N, as vector configuration in a vector space over F. And if your G arise from such a commutative diagram, then you know that your G must be always a morphism. And let's say such morphisms are representable over F. by definition. So there is an obvious generating polynomial that you want to look at. Which is the basis generating polynomial for G. But this is another case where the natural base generating function to consider is not homogeneous. So let's just homogenize. So the homogeneous basis generating function for G is, let's say, FG. It has one more variable, W0, which is used to homogenize, and another variable for every element in the ground set E of the source. And it's defined as the sum of W0 to the cardinality of E minus S, where the sum is over S, which is a basis of G. And then you multiply by the basis. And the theorem, which you can prove, and we did prove, with Chris Er is that for any such G, FG is Lorentzian. And the special cases that we have to keep in mind is the first, the case when G is the identity map. And then the basis of G is simply the basis of that single matroid. And this is basically the basis generating function for the 
may try it. You ship that by a certain amount, but that's uh, negligible. And the second case is when G is final, meaning that the target N is the unique rank zero matroid on a singleton set. And in this case, the second condition that GS contains a basis of N is empty. So we are looking at the independent set generating polynomial of M. And the claim is that it's this degree E homogenization is Lorentzian. And that is the statement be behind the so-called Mason's strong low concavity conjecture for the F factor of independence complex of M. So the conjecture that we do not know how to prove in almost all cases is that if G is representable over F, then this homogenized generating function FG is a volume polynomial over F. So we expect to find a projective variety over F equipped with N different NEF divisors whose volume polynomial is the given basis generating polynomial. I mean, we, other than the Lorentzianness of FG, which turned out to be very useful in combinatorial considerations, we have very little idea why this might be true, but it looks like a nice statement to consider. But there is one special case where this was the beginning of what I think is a very beautiful story. So when G is the identity, this polynomial is the basis generating polynomial. And that one, when in the case when matroid is representable over F, turns out to be the volume polynomial of a very beautiful variety that we now call the matroid Schubert variety. So when a matroid is representable, you can think of it as a linear subspace of a coordinated vector space, F to the N. So you compactify F to the N by P1 to the N, and you can take the closure of your linear subspace in a P1 to the N to get a very interesting but highly singular projective variety. So because it lives in P1 to the N, it comes equipped with a natural choice of NAP divisors. And if you compute the volume polynomial, it turns out to be exactly the basis generating polynomial. And then it turns out that you can define what you would call the combinatorial intersection cohomology of such a guy in purely matroidal terms. And that is the beginning of the proof of the top heavy conjecture and the non-negativity of the cosmolistic polynomials for matrix. So I'll stop here. Thank you. All right. Thanks to June for a very lovely talk. Are there a couple of questions? Yes. That's right. So the question is about my remark that there are Lorentzian polynomials that are not volume polynomials over F or any field F. And the reason I know that this is the case is that there is uh, something called the reverse tessier kowalski inequality, which are originally proved by Lehman and Xiao using Yao's theorem over the complex numbers on solvability of some long jump pair equations. But in the end, the conclusion is some very concrete inequalities for a certain number of divisors, which, yeah, certain number of NEF divisors. And you can construct 
uh, cubic Lorentzian polynomial in three variables, which you can feed to the computer and check that it's Lorentzian, but do not satisfy this so-called uh, reverse Alexander of Angel inequality. And then the proof of the reverse Alexander of Angel inequality was recently extended to the case of arbitrary algebraically closed field. So the question is, once you have found your Lorentzian polynomial, how do you find your A, for example, or, or is there a recipe for it? And the my answer would be no. You still need a lot of ingenuity to get to the right A. But as I have briefly remarked before, there is an obvious first try, which probably will fail is to just look at the Gorenstein algebra co-generated by your volume polynomial. This would work if your hypothetical projective variety X is smooth and also its cohomology is sort of generated by divisor. So no funky cycles in higher co-dimension. In that case, you will work. This is what has worked in the case of smooth projective toric varieties, for example. All right, I think actually for the sake of time, we should um, probably continue more conversations after the talk individually, but let's thank June for his very, oh wait, oh, sorry, Vic, Vic has a question, a chat question, go ahead. Ah, yeah, the weight multiplicity conjecture for non-root directions. So there is a, like a little story behind this. So there's a, this is a, the weight multiplicity conjecture for at least a finite dimensional case. It's a special case of Okunkov's log concavity conjecture on little Richardson rules. So the, uh, the original conjecture is that there's this little Richardson rules as a function of three partitions maybe is discrete log concave function. And that one turned out to be not true. So uh, some people find uh, reasonably small, but not too small counterexample to this conjecture. But Okunkov in his original paper has proved as evidence to this conjecture that the conjecture is true in an asymptotic sense. So there is a, some symplectic setting where you can formulate and prove the asymptotic version of this log concavity conjecture. And in that asymptotic setting, there is no requirement on, no reason to prefer certain directions. So it's log concave just as a function in the continuous sense, maybe. So in so maybe like in going to this discrete version or maybe quantizing, I, I don't know, we had to restrict our directions to root directions. And we do not know whether the log concavity is still true in arbitrary direction. So my, my guess or my hope is that it's actually not true in non-root directions, but I do not have an example. But I, I strongly feel that in this uh, discrete setting, there, there are good aesthetic reason to prefer to think that only these uh, very special directions survive. I'm just because I like generalized permutations. All right, well, let's thank June again for a very lovely talk. <laughs>